everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Reverend Jim Blake, and he is going to be talking to us about his book, The Zen Executive, Gems of Wisdom for Enlightened Leadership. It is a fabulous title. Welcome, Jim. Thank you so much. It is my honor and pleasure to be here with you. I'm, um, I'm thrilled to talk to you about um, your life story because I, I find you very interesting. So you started as a computer science major. Um, you, went, you had some stints in the corporate world and then you became a unity minister. So can you share with us kind of how, how your life took this journey? Sure. Sure, I came from very humble beginnings, uh, not a whole lot of religion. My mom was pretty religious from the age of about seven to 10 to putting me on a school bus to a Baptist Sunday school. But other than that, the family was, was not real religious. And so uh, I got away from it for a long time. And it wasn't until I got to college, where, as you mentioned, I was my undergrad was in computer science, and I took my first world religions course. Mm. And it just blew my mind. I was really struck by the different traditions and the different way they saw, you know, God or the universe, and and then began to notice the thread of golden truths that sort of ran mm -hmm. through all of those traditions. And so it kind of turned me into a seeker right then and there. And oh. uh, I uh, then went on and, and, you know, went to work in the corporate world, as you said, for 25 years, I was in the, the IT industry. And, but I kept pursuing, you know, on the side, I you, for some reason, we keep those compartmentalized. I'll talk about that a little bit later, probably. But um, so I read and I studied yoga and the eight limb paths of yoga. And I studied Hinduism and I studied Buddhism. Um, and I just experimented and explored um, all these different traditions until I got to a place where I was sort of like, wow, why do I keep these two things compartmentalized? mentalized is there a way for me to bridge the gap between you know what i'm doing in my spiritual life and what i'm doing in the corporate world and i know it's non-traditional but the way that i'm showing up spiritually is the way i want to show up in the corporate world and what if i do that what mm -hmm. what happens if i do that mm -hmm. what happens if i take some of these same principles and and bring them to work with me and so mm -hmm. um that's essentially oh and then i i did stumble across unity back in 06 to 11 I served as the CIO and VP of operations. They needed an IT operations person. I came here and then I really became in, intrigued by their teachings and the founders and their journey. And the campus here is extraordinary. It's a 1200 acre campus with wow. high in architecture, red tile roofs. It's got a golf course, a state of the art hotel and conference center, walking trails, fishing lakes. And so it's almost like this resort. Wow. They had, they had a seminary on property and and uh, wow. I really got um, started to meet some really awesome people that were kind of on the same path I was. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I, it's like I found my tribe, if you will. Yeah. So I was able to really merge both the, my spiritual practice and my and my corporate gifts and do so in a place where it was not only received, but welcomed and embraced. And so mm -hmm. it, it really felt good. I left yeah. for a little while to, to gain some other experience. And then I returned in this this capacity as CEO. And minister. So you actually decided to get to what was what? How did that come about? Well, when I was here the first time, we were offered as executives the opportunity to attend the seminary um, free of charge as long as we could maintain our workload. And so, as I mentioned, being the seeker guy, I was like, I can't turn that down. So I, I signed <laughs> up and I didn't really have a direction or a plan. I didn't necessarily feel called to ministry, but I was really called to the Masters of Divinity program. And after that, you could you could become ordained. And so it wasn't long where I felt like, OK, I should probably become ordained, but I'm still not clear what I would do with it. And mm. um, I didn't I only got about halfway through the program. Then I left and did some other things. But when I came back in 2016, I started pursuing it again and I found a different seminary, uh, Johnny Coleman Theological Seminary. And I, I got my master's degree there. And then uh, Unity, the Unity folks that do the ordination and credentialing uh, basically approached me and said, you know, you've done all the work. Um, you could be ordained if you like. And it really felt right. And so I took advantage of it. And what I can tell you is for me, it was a sort of a punctuation, uh, an exclamation point, if you will, on the uh, realization and transformation. I guess I used to think I was a corporate guy. Yeah. Yeah a really good corporate guy that was a spiritual seeker. And what I what I came to learn through this whole journey is that really I'm a deeply spiritual person with some good corporate gifts. 
<laughs> that reverend title for me sort of solidified that in my own mind. It changed mm-hmm. the way I identified myself and it mm. helps, helps me in terms of how I show up in the world, if that makes sense. Mm. So, so you started off feeling compartmentalized. Now you're yeah. unified at yep. the Unity Church. <laughs> <laughs> And I assume that I'm presuming, and I don't know if this is true because I apologize, I don't know enough about the Unity Church, but I assume it was in, in alignment with the per, the path that you had, which was pursuing lots of different religions. Is that the idea of Unity Church? Yeah, so the, the Unity Movement is made up of two organizations. It, it does have 600 to 1,000 churches globally. Our sister organization, Unity Worldwide Ministries, oversees all the churches and the ministers. Here at headquarters, we we produce magazines, uh, most notably the Daily Word, which is a hundred year old daily devotional, Unity magazine. We have the campus where we do retreats and events, um, and we also have books and booklets. So we do all kinds of books and booklets mm-hmm. and booklets on everything from you know spiritual approach to grief to addiction to becoming a caregiver. Some of us are unexpectedly becoming caregivers. Prosperity. And so the headquarters where I where I'm serving is all about providing these resources to the world. It's a mm. it's a, unity is a non-denominational faith tradition. It was couched in Christianity in the late 1800s because that was the the religion of the West. But the how they they even named it this way because the founders studied all of the world religions, largely Eastern traditions. Wow. And what they thought were were the best of those principles into this philosophy and called it unity because it was a unification mm. of the um, golden threads, if you will. And so that's a little bit about the history of unity. And then, and then of course, what we do here at headquarters and, and what I'm doing here. Yeah. And so here, thus the title, the Zen executive, right? You're merging these mm. Eastern principles, these spiritual principles into kind of a corporate world, a spiritual person, as I, I love how you said, a spiritual person with some corporate gifts. I love that. Okay, so I want to actually go dive into that a little bit more because, you know, we're living in a world um, of uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty with COVID, with the economy, with Black Lives Matter. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that we're living with uncertainty, um, which I assume has an impact on the church. And I'm just wondering, you know, as your organization, as the CEO of this organization of the Unity Church, what are some of the challenges that you've had um, and, that, and that all organizations have? But what is your unique slice of what, you know, what does that look like for your organization? Yeah, so let me, if I start a little bit at the beginning, what I'll tell you is what I walked into was a, a culture that had sort of become aged and hadn't done a lot of innovation and wasn't really healthy. There was a lot of focusing on what was broken and wasn't working instead of what was possible and what could be working. Mm. So we spent a lot of time removing that. And you do that by building trust and credibility, saying what you're going to do and then doing it. The second thing we wanted to do was establish that our associates were the most important resource. And can you tell what associates are those the people who are at the individual contributor level? Is that? Yeah. So here at the, at the world headquarters where we do the books and magazines and everything, we have 300 associates. Um, we also have a hundred year old prayer ministry. So there's a phone number and electronic means where you can call for prayer 24, seven, five, someone will pray with you. And then that prayer is put in a prayer vigil chapel and our associates um, continuously hold vigil over those requests for 30 days. Wow. So, there's 100 associates that do that, and then the other 200 are taking care of the rest of the camp list and the publishing arm and uh, all of those things. So that's the organization that I'm overseeing today is, is 300, roughly 300 associates that are uh, doing everything from customer care to HR to accounting to finance to publishing, et cetera. Wow. Okay, got it. So age and innovation and the focus on what was broken versus what's yeah. not working. So that's just so endemic, I think to kind of a corporate approach we think about what's broken and we go fix it you know we re-engineer it and break you know something's broken go re-engineer it versus thinking about what our desired outcome is versus trying to fix the thing that was broken um is, uh, that's where i'm jumping to conceptually but is that where you went or what did you oh, you're do? exactly right that's exactly right and 
that, you know, one of the first things we did was get people to sort of recall why they were here. I mean, it's a spiritual nonprofit. It has a four-day work week. Some people are here just for the four-day work week, but most people are here because they feel called to something more noble, serving people, helping people find these tools and resources that transform their life. And when you do that, you sort of reset everyone's center point, right? They remember, oh yeah, I'm here because of this important work in the world. And now they start focusing on that instead of all these perceived um, lacks, uh, you know, lack consciousness in terms of, of, of different things. And so uh, we started to shift there and then really worked hard on building trust and credibility and then demonstrating our commitment to them with, you know, additional holidays and better benefits and quarterly socials and, and holiday parties and everything you can think of that would help them to feel loved, appreciated, and um, create a healthy, supportive environment. I changed the leadership style. We have one leadership style here. It's a servant leadership. If you're not a servant leader, you can't be here because fear and intimidation and command and control are the complete opposite in terms of, and this is what I talk about in the book, they will, they will render the complete opposite results that you're trying to seek if you want to be successful. So if you, mm -hmm. you think about someone who's, who's uh, going to their job every day and they're under constant stress and anxiety because you lead through fear and intimidation. So you're scaring them into being productive or you're intimidating them into being productive. They won't bring you any new ideas because they're scared you'll think they're dumb. And they're certainly scared to death of making mistakes. So they're not going to try anything new. Mm. And oh, by the way, how do you think their mental and emotional state is every day at work? Mm. Here's the sad part. And this is where leaders really have the opportunity to influence. That goes home with people. Mm. You keep them at the office. So you're taking that stress and anxiety home with you. And it's there with your family or it's in a road rage incident on the way home. And mm -hmm. Take the opposite approach. Create a leadership philosophy where the managers and leaders are there just to support the, the folks that are doing a lot of the really hard work directly with your constituents, providing the resources they need, making sure they, they uh, are taken care of in terms of a proper environment and, and ergonomic workstations and the latest and greatest in tools and technologies, and then continuing to affirm um, their good behaviors and their good performances. That person, is really healthy mentally and emotionally, right? Mm. They're not taking anything home. So which do you think is more productive? My stressed out, anxious friend or my friend who feels supported and uplifted and, and uh, you know, is, is, is affirmed regularly for the work they're doing. It's yeah. the second person. And so now think of 300 associates who feel that way. How productive is your organization? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. So you started off in um, perhaps... <laughs> the leadership style previously, for better or worse, and, and I think it's typical of most leadership styles, are not oriented. It's more of a, not a servant leadership, but more of an authoritative, top-down kind of um, approach. And part of that structure is to lead through fear, intimidation, goals, um, what have you done for me lately, yep. versus the approach that you're bringing, which is about love and appreciation and support demonstrated through like actual structural things that you're doing like changing vacation days and um providing parties and times to connect and those are things that um i think sometimes people roll their eyes like how is that going to make a difference but exactly. it really <laughs> and i'm just curious so you implemented this strategy because sometimes that's a leap of faith so to speak <laughs> It it's a leap of faith because people have this leadership style that has been so um, in the forefront of how we think about leadership. You have this Zen executive style, which is about um, love and appreciation and support um, and celebrating people and their creativity and innovation and all those kinds of things. So. Tell me in the beginnings. It sounds now great because you know the end of the story. It all went yep, well, yep. I assume. <laughs> but, but tell us what it was like initially implementing something like that. What were some of the challenges that you faced? Because I think we all, well, first of all, tell us the beautiful end, end of the story. Tell us a fairy tale that happened afterwards. What changed as a result of implementing these things? And then take us back to what were the initial steps like? So, uh, let me also get rid of a myth, right? And, okay. and you're right, it was a leap of faith. I, I, had, I had developed and architected all these 
different things I wanted to implement. They were successful at department and division levels, but this was my first chance to say, okay, will this style really work at an organizational level? And look, I had the same doubts everyone else had. Will everyone think I'm too nice? Can we still hold people accountable? Will they be productive or will it be like recess every day for everyone? Right. <laughs> so um, we, the end, of course, is that it was successful and our people are far more productive than they ever were before. And they're engaged. Everyone in, in corporate world, everyone goes, how do we get engagement with our associates? What I will tell you is when you do these sorts of things that we're talking about, people are automatically engaged because they love where they work. They feel seen and heard and cared for. It instantly builds engagement. And so um, in the end, we're in a really good place. We've attracted some really great talent um, and we continue to grow and get better in everything we do. Our average tenure went from five years to 11 years. So that means people come here, wow. they stay for 11 years now. Wow. And so um, it okay. really creates some good commitment and engagement. Okay, I'm going to be a corporate nerd and um, have to ask you the hard questions because sure. this is these are the kinds I actually work with um, companies doing corporate um, culture change. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you, I just I want to hear because and I want people and I'm trying to have them do some of the things that you're mentioning. That's why yeah. this is complete in alignment. But you'll get the question like, how do you measure productivity? So you gave me one stat on um, engagement, which is like retention from five to 11 years. But how did you measure that they, how do you know that they're more productive? How do you know that they're more engaged aside from the one stat that you gave me? So if you look, here's, here's what I would say. We have kept staff flat across the entire six years I've been here, okay? Mm -hmm. Every major measurable statistic in the organization from an outward facing perspective, and this is, this is not what we're about, by the way. Our, our goal, our, what we say as a leadership team is if we focus on the work, the rest will take care of itself. The rest being revenue, numbers, and so forth. And so we focus on the mission. But here's what I would say. Every single one of our social media channels is growing. Our hotel is at its highest occupancy rate as it ever has been. We put two new Airbnbs in place that are constantly booked. Our books and magazine are selling more than they ever have before um, and growing for the first time in decades. I mean, you're looking, you're talking about a hundred year old magazine. That thing peaked years ago and, <laughs> and has been on a long, you know, downward decline. And now right. we took it flat and now it's actually starting to grow a little bit again. So I would say all of the things in terms of what's important to us is how many more people are we serving? All of those measurements are growing. And I've got the same number of people. So what does that tell you? Yeah, we're more profitable, more, people, more sales, more we're serving money more coming people, in. We're reaching more people. And, and so um, that tells me we're, we're more productive. And look, here's the thing. The myth I was referring to earlier is people are afraid that if I'm nice like this, I can't hold anybody accountable. I'm just a big doormat, mm -hmm. which is not true. Mm -hmm. You still hold people accountable. Every single one of our operations has corporate best practices for measuring performance. Goals have to be smart goals, measurable. and and um, the way you hold people accountable, it's the same way you would have before. You're just not mean about it. You're not demeaning. It's not <laughs> punitive. You're just, saying, you're just sticking to the facts. You're basically saying, hey, listen, here's what we're trying to do. And you're not doing that. Is there something I can help you with? How can we get there? And if you can't get there, the results are the same. I'm sorry. You know, it, it, we tried it. You're not able to meet these goals. And so um, we're going to have to let you go or you're going to have to move on. You can do those things with empathy and compassion and step people through it. It's the same. You're still holding people accountable. You're just doing it in a, in a better way, I guess, mm. is what I would say. And in a way that is more human, I guess, is what I would say. Right. And I think, I mean, those are the things that are hard. I mean, as the, the typical things that I've heard in terms of what makes cu culture so toxic is that they're there's a lot of blame going around, right? It's that person that's so toxic. And actually, sometimes it is that person is <laughs> toxic and they oh, just come in with like a sense of negative belief systems, ideas, and they and there's like some joy in pre-populating everyone, like populating and spreading their own sense of what the world is all about. And it's it just kind of like permeates the air around them and it starts affecting other people. So they truly are toxic. Um, that's at least what I've seen. Um, have you seen something similar? How do you know when someone is toxic and, and when can they be redeemed? <laughs> I 
guess <laughs> using your language, is there redemption here? And when can you say, you know, you're redeemable, but maybe go someplace else? Like, yep. how do you how do you deal with those situations? Because I'm sure that's happened when you're in your transformation. Yeah, so there's a, a book called Traction that uh, we use to help, you know, re-engineer and re, uh, reorient our business processes. And in that book, it has a great suggestion that I think everyone should do. So we recreated our values and our mission when I first started. The values were really important because they are basically how we agree we're going to show up and interact with one another on a daily basis. Well, we put those in your annual performance review. So yes, you are accountable to do these things as a part of your job and adhere to these values. So at performance time, so if you're toxic and you're negative and you're going around and upsetting everyone, I can very clearly in, our, in review time or at any other time say, you are not doing your job because you're not adhering to these values. 98% of the people around this organization are showing up and representing these values. Give me an example of the values. Tell me some of the values so people have a sense of what you're talking um, about. So ours are, the first one is service, obviously, um, but it's inclusivity, uh, innovation, um, service, and there's one more which is completely escaping me right now. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> but each one of them has a, a pretty brief, a pretty good long description. And the inclusiveness one is really probably one of the most important because it's really honoring um, of all people and in all ways and making people feel seen and heard and being treated with respect. And um, so that if, if someone is really toxic, it's usually, they're usually in, in conflict with that particular value. Um, and so it's really uh, easy for us to, to have a coaching session and try to call them up. And what I will tell you is when we did that, Everyone else applauded it and embraced it. It keeps us from having to have that conversation that we've all had. Like, oh my gosh, I ran into this Bob guy and he was awful, man. What is that guy's deal? Right. <laughs> oh, that's just Bob. Bob's good at his job. He's just really cranky. You just got to learn to deal with him. Well, we don't do that here. You don't have to learn to deal with Bob. If Bob can't represent the values like everyone else, then like you said earlier, Bob just doesn't get to be here. And so that, that is a super great model for how you maintain a healthy culture and make sure that some one person doesn't come in and start to spin the whole thing uh, in the wrong direction. Okay. So I'm going to be Bob. I want okay. to see you talk to Bob. <clears throat> okay. We're, we're, I've, 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 you know, I'm Bob, you've submitted this idea for like an innovative idea. And I'm telling you again, that's stupid. We did it that same way. You know, we, we've done that like 10 years ago. It didn't work. It will never work. I don't want to spend the money. Why were you wasting your time bringing this into me? Jim, why, why? Like, I just don't want to do this at all. And, and I'm going to block doing this across because this is just not a good idea. Okay. So, so if I'm Bob. Do I work for you, Bob, or are we peers, or how? How? What's I don't that? know. You tell me how you would want to okay. run it. Well, either way, I okay, would let's say, say that, let's say, let's actually do. We're peers. You are reporting under me, or now, or now you're the boss of Bob, yeah. of Bob. Okay, let's just see how it sounds. Well, first I would start off, and I'd say, "Hey, listen, Bob. I'm glad that." Uh, Who are you first? Are you are you the peer or the direct report? Let me say. Let me say, Bob's my direct report. Okay. Let's just say that. Yeah. Okay. We'll just deal with the toxic personality first. And I'll say, I'm glad you were able to make time for me. I wanted to let you know that in terms of your job and what you've been doing lately, you're doing really, really great at these things. But the reason I called you here was to talk to you a little bit about your attitude. Um, I've heard several complaints from a lot of different people about how you're showing up. Um, I don't know if you know this, but in some cases you're showing up as disrespectful. Um, in other cases, you're dismissive. And people don't really feel seen and heard around you. And in some well, people, who, who said that? Was that was that Jim that said that? I'm yeah. just curious. What, what did they say? So I can't I can't necessarily share with you who brought these things forth, but I will tell you it was more than one person, which suggests a pattern. And so I would just invite you to be open to considering how you're showing up. And what I would say is. We can't, you can't show up that way. And so well, I'm showing up doing my job, doing exactly what I'm supposed to do, making sure we have innovations. It's within budgets, within the time and we don't make mistakes. Sure. I 100% agree with you that in these areas you're doing well. But remember, a big portion of what we do here is our values and how we show up and how we interact with one another. And all the rest of us are adhering to those values and we're able to treat each other with respect and, and honor one another. And all I'm asking is, 
And what I'm hearing is that's not happening with you. And I would like to talk to you about if there's any way you can consider that and consider ways we could improve that so that uh, people feel comfortable around you and they can be open with you. I, I will guarantee you that those relationships will strengthen and people will be far more productive if they don't feel this sort of negative energy that uh, that you're putting off uh, now. Bob. Well, I, I guarantee you this is Jim and I'll tell you what the issues are with Jim. Sure. Jim always comes in with these half-baked ideas. He's done it for the last five years. They're not well thought out. They're over budget. I mean, all the things that I'm asked to do. So, you know, whether it's Jim or possibly it was Carol, who I mean, I'm, I can kind of tell you who the people are that you're talking about. Like, I just, yeah, I, I know who those people are. And I, yeah. So look, there are always two sides to every story. I am happy to listen to you with regard to, to both of those individuals. But I, before we go down that path, I would just ask, is it possible that you are showing up that way? And even if the, the ideas are, um, out of alignment in terms of what you're expecting. Remember, we've established a culture of innovation. We're inviting people to bring ideas forward. And so there's no harm in listening to them and considering them. There's also no harm in giving positive, constructive feedback rather than disrespectful and unmotivating feedback. So is there is there a way that you could maybe reposition how you're approaching Jim in terms of these ideas and how you're giving him feedback in terms of these ideas. What about if Jim and Carol are just wrong? I mean, I know they're wrong. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> so what I would say is, again, I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to get into who it is. And uh, certainly you can have your opinion about, about those two people. It still doesn't change the facts here. You're showing up in a particular way that isn't in alignment with our values and how we want you to show up. So let's take the people and set them aside. Let's take the personalities and set them aside and let's focus on the behavior. This behavior needs to change. I'm offering you an opportunity to explain it and talk to me about um, how you might be willing to change it or at least consider that you're showing up in that way. And so far, I'm hearing a lot of, of uh, a pushback to even considering seeing yourself in that way. So um, again, I'm gonna invite you and I'm gonna ask you to tell me, is it possible that you could show up better in some of these exchanges with Jim or Carol or whoever may be on your team. Yeah, but what do you want me to do? I would like for you to be respectful and kind and uh, be a listening ear for these people. You don't have to like their ideas. You don't have to like anyone's ideas, but you do have to treat people with respect and you have to honor them as your associates and as equals. And if you can't do that, Bob, Unfortunately, you won't be able to stay on this team because it's a requirement of what, and it's what we expect here. So um, do you think you can do that? Well, I feel like I'm being respectful by telling them the truth um, of the matter and, and sh sharing with them the history. Um, I mean, I can keep on doing what I'm doing. I mean, I think it's kind to tell people the hard, cold, hard truth of what's happening. Well, let, let me just give you, let me just speak to one of your examples, Bob. We tried something 10 years ago. Well, guess what? That was 10 years ago. The players here are different. The world is different. There are a number of things that are different. Just because we tried something in the past doesn't mean we can't try it again now. What's the harm in trying? We're going to fail. Okay, so we fail. We fail fast. We learn from our mistakes and we move on. But the idea that you're not going to accept any ideas that have ever been presented before is a huge mistake. You're not giving anyone an opportunity. More important, you're not giving the organization an opportunity to consider ways to constantly improve and challenge ourselves and grow. So I, we could sit here all day and you can give me every example and we can walk through why I think that's not respectful. Um, and I'm happy to do that with you. If okay, need. that was really good. Okay, that was actually, I'll stop there, but I'm, I'm kind of, I, I'm, I thought that that was really good um, on so many different levels, but what's so interesting is that you were Zen throughout the whole time. Um, you didn't get triggered during this whole situation. There's clearly someone who's def defensive. Am I a good Bob? Didn't I do a good job with Bob? You did a great <laughs> job with Bob, actually. <laughs> I can channel Bob. <laughs> I've seen a lot of Bob. I'm kind of scared that you may have been Bob one time or something. <laughs> 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 
there are bobs all over the place and it's yeah. kind of an oppositional defensive kind of person who doesn't yeah. want to change right so if you're talking about toxicity this is one form of toxicity right someone who is just constantly fighting has their own worldview and what i loved about what you did is um you're calm throughout the whole thing number one and two you didn't let bob get away with like you're always like i'm here to help you i'm here to i mean i'm just trying going back to the things that you did that you said i hear you i want to hear you but then you also offered a whole bunch of different alternatives like perhaps for someone i'm not going to tell you if it's jim or carol like you just you know created confidentiality and um, you said it was more than one person. So this is a trend in house. You looked a little, it was always factual. There's yep. more than one person. I'm not gonna tell you who it is. There's no blame game, but I wanna hear your perspective, which is like, I value and respect that you have a different perspective. I'm here to hear it. And then when um, Bob went off on like explaining you know, his justification and, and, you know, what was happening, you're like, let's go down and like, let's do this thing about 10 years ago, this was done and this will never happen again. <laughs> and you kind of like, that's just wrong. You know, that's, that's not the right way we want you to do things. And that was actually the thing that finally changed me, I think, because I thought, oh, that's wrong. Why is that wrong? Like, it started creating a seed of doubt in my head that, like, well, why is that wrong? Because people who are very toxic, generally, they have a way of doing things. It's yep. black and white, and they're never going to change it forever. And so uh, that was the first time when, in my head, channeling Bob, that I thought, okay, maybe he's right. Like, I never thought about it that way, but no one has ever challenged Bob to think in that way. So he hasn't, and you're someone who's a po in power and authority. So I'm willing to listen to you because I, I may get fired. I mean, I don't think Bob, in this case, I don't think Bob would be as oppositional given that he is your direct report, but you never know. I mean, I actually have seen direct reports that are completely oppositional, defensive, and not willing to change whatsoever yeah, for sure. yeah so um what happened from your perspective when you heard bob like it so when you're if you take some of the principles in zen executive what were some of the things that happened for you well the, the first thing you noticed right off the bat the important thing is to so it's all about facts this isn't personal um i don't I, it's not personal about bob it, you the, the key thing is staying focused on the circumstance not the person so it's the circumstance and facts is not not the person and you just have to keep coming back to those and people are great at deflecting and blaming and trying to get you to go down this other rabbit hole yeah i went down the path of the 10-year thing only as an example and that's probably the only time i would have done that mm -hmm. because you have to keep coming back to the central point otherwise folks will drive you all over the yard here and and you'll never be able to get to why you're really there to talk to them but but staying calm and centered and to your point not being triggered. Certainly, um, you didn't see it, but there's a part of me that's like, wow, Bob, how long are you going to do this? I mean, really, it's, <laughs> you're just going to keep coming back. You know, can, I've asked you three times, can you just possibly see that you could show up differently? And so inside, you're thinking, man, I want to get frustrated, but that's not going to do anything because escalation just begets further escalation. And so if I stay calm and just keep coming back, it'll be far more productive. So that's one, you know, staying calm, not being triggered, understanding that you can be far more effective coming from a place of peace than you come, can from a place of emotion. Here's the other thing. If I'm emotional, I can't address the things that you're throwing at me in near, with near the clarity because now I'm emotional and my decisions aren't going to be good. My responses aren't going to be good versus if I just stay centered and, and at peace, then I can... I can clearly hear what you're saying and then clearly stick to my guns of trying to get back to why are we here? What is the issue? And are you willing to work on these issues? Yeah. And that's, you kept on repeating. If people were to rewind and listen, you kept on repeating over and over again, which is like, I'm here because we need you to show up differently. I'm here because we need you to show up differently. I think you may have said that four or five different times. And actually, as I was a Matt channeling my Bob, I didn't hear any of those until, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because when people are on like their Bobness, because yep. that's what happens when you, 
And what we do when we are working with clients is teach them about their defensive patterns and the different way. So I showed you Bob, which is like oppositional, which is actually the hardest one to work with. There's always like, well, we've done it that way. You know, there's this avoidance and kind of like, I'm not gonna show up and like, I can't do it. Like that's another form of defensiveness. It's like a passive defensiveness versus an aggressive defensiveness. Yep. But yep. I think the hardest is knowing how to deal with the bobs or the, well, okay, all right, I'll just do what you want me to do. You know, that kind of thing. We're like, no, I want to hear your ideas. That's where innovation comes from. It's like, well, what are your ideas? Okay, I'll just do that. You know, like there's two different forms of defensiveness, but it's interesting to, to I think what you, what I love what you did is one, stayed calm, two, not get triggered because the game is lost because once someone amps up the other person just either amps up or, or crawls even deeper into whatever hole that they're in yeah. um and then i also liked how um you kept over and over and over again how are we going to change your behavior how are we going to change your behavior and then to the point where like this guy went on and on blaming accusing wanting to like get into like you're saying i was trying to drag you all over the place yeah, right you did. You can... <laughs> well because that's what happens in reality right yep exactly so you kind of kept me back and back and back and back to center and then even to the point that i was like that you're like let me give you an example of what it means to change your behavior this whole tenure idea is like this is doesn't make sense bob you know we yeah. want it to be this way and then that was a time when I was finally like, okay, that worked with me. That is like, uh-huh, okay, I get it. So it's about, I think, almost being focused on mission, which is like a corporate thing. But it's, I, I kept on seeing you focus, 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 focus on the values. Um, how? Let's go back to your own inner work. And yeah. what allowed you to stay focused and calm during this interaction with Bob? Well, there's so, so that's a long journey. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it starts with with self awareness, and the self awareness part is being willing to sort of explore your own, really get to know yourself inside. What are your triggers, and be truthful about those. Um, I would say the other thing is is going to be self acceptance. You have to be at a place where you sort of know who you are and accept that. For a long time, I always thought I was so different, and that really troubled me. But over the years, as I began the practice of self acceptance and self love. Uh, and sort of got rid of the critical voice in my head, for the most part, um, I began to understand that it's my uniqueness that's really my superpower. Mm. It, it makes me different from everyone else. And that's mm. that's really the beauty, is all of our unique gifts and our unique expressions. And and so when you're at peace with yourself, you're, more, you're less likely to get rattled because you're really comfortable with who you are. Mm. You know what your triggers are. Look, there's, there's probably at least once a week where I will say out loud in a conversation, wow, I am really triggered right now. And I'll say it out loud to the people around me. And it's, right. it's okay to say, look, I'm really feeling some emotion about this. And, and in some cases, we can talk our way through it. In other cases, I say, man, I'm, I'm going to have to continue this conversation. I got to step away. <laughs> um, so it's really being confident and just owning that stuff and owning it yeah, about yeah. It. Because once you're aware of it, you can begin to change it. Um, so it, it's just about, and then controlling the things that Eckhart Tolle and Michael Singer and some of those have been teaching us for years, which is the chattering mind. Everybody has one. And generally your mind is going to spiral negative um, and it's going to be self-critical. And so if you can create healthy habits around how you stop that spiral, how you stop the negative chatter, use affirmations to change your thoughts and find some sort of practice that will actually allow you to lean away from the chattering mind or become still. Lots of people use meditation. Some people use yoga. There's no right way. It could be a bike. Some people like to do bike rides. Others find it when they're exercising. Some people when they're gardening. Just create space in your life to create that opening where you quiet the mind. That's where inspiration comes from. It's where guidance comes from. And it also begins to teach you and cultivate that space of peace. And so that 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 tranquility so that you know when you're not that mm -hmm. over time you begin to notice really drastically that I'm not that right now and can I take a couple of breaths and return to that so anyway that's a lot of explanation but those are all the things I had to work on and learn and sort of work my way through to to get to a place like this and okay it, it so if, if, 
when I had, if I had talked to, well, I just truthfully, was there anything that I did that did kind of trigger you on the inside? And how did you do it? Would, did anything that Bob say trigger you? And how did you work with that to still the chatter in your mind um, or uh, the negative chatter or triggers that kind of popped up? Was there anything that for, for you sure. that popped the, up? The thing that was triggering me the most was the constant ignoring of why we were there. Okay. And deflection, the repeated deflection. And so yeah. there would have come a point where I would have said, okay, listen, it doesn't feel like we're making a whole lot of progress here. Right. So this, is, this is what I'm asking. And if you can't really do this, then here are going to be the ramifications. And then you just end the dialogue. Because to your point, some people will do that, you know, to an infinity. And I am, um, I'm patience. I'm pretty patient, but it's still a growing edge for me. Mm -hmm. So to have to, you know, I'm happy to repeat it a handful of times, but much beyond that, then I'm going to, that's what's, it's going to trigger me. Cause now I feel like we're not being efficient. This is a waste of time. We're not really getting anywhere. We're in this cycle. Does that make sense? Right. The engineer goes like, mm -mm. Yep. <laughs> broken, <laughs> this is broken. Yeah. And it's not, I can't, I can't keep on rehashing these same things over and over again. And I love that you said that because I think people don't know what to do. Like I've tried and I, I'm going to have another conversation with Bob and Bob's going to take me down the same circuitous path. Right. But I think it's like, listen, if the, if you can't change here, are some of the circumstance, I'd really like you to change in this one area. I'll give you the resources to change, but if you can't, here are going to be the consequences. Right. Cause that didn't happen in this scenario with Bob, but that's where you would have gone if Bob continued. Cause I, you know, I assume that you have like another meeting with Bob and then at a certain point you're like, I, I don't know what, what would be your threshold and boundary or like, Bob, <laughs> we're yeah. ending this conversation. Would you, cause we, we did like probably 20 minutes of Bob and I try to like accelerate how my Bobness during that time, what would you say is, cause I think people don't know the boundaries. Like how many chances should I give Bob? Should I have five meetings or one meeting or an hour? And then like, Bob, you know, how long would it take you before you got to that place? So I really, we really don't have much of a tolerance for that toxicity stuff. So we'll do a verbal coaching and then a write up. The third strike is really it. You, you can be, we can continue to try to work if you're showing progress, but if there's no change by the third time, then, uh, then you can't be here. And depending on how egregious the toxicity is, you may set that in the first talk. Like we, I, we may have had to say, Bob, if you can't change this behavior in 30 days, you know, you, you can't be here with us. Um, but the thing is, each time you're setting, these are the goals I expect you to meet in this time frame. If they meet it, then you're good. If they don't, then what are the, what are the ramifications? Do you move to a write-up? Do you move to release or what have you? But each one of those has to be measurable. Um, and you just can't spend that much time because, especially with toxic personalities, because they impact the whole, they go around and create a ripple effect in your whole organization. Totally I mean, they make do. everyone miserable. And then you as leaders start to lose trust and credibility because you're saying, I care about you guys and we're here to support you and whatever. And they're out there going, yeah, but you let Bob work here. And he's, yeah, why is Bob people. sitting here? Like, well, because he does good work. You're like, right. does it matter if he does good work and makes everyone feel awful about coming to work? Probably not, <laughs> you know, like what, what, at what point, unless you can kind of, I mean, I've seen these bobs for a while, like, unless you can kind of like put them in a little like Rapunzel situation where they're in a tower where they, no yeah. one talks to them, they're off to the side. They just like let their hair down and do the thing that they need to do when they need to do it. And otherwise like put them in the castle and make them go away. I mean, it's really, it's really hard. And even then it's like, but why are you still allowing Bob, if this is your, if the, if you're truly in alignment with your values, why does Bob still allow it to exist? Even if he's quartered off in a safe place. I think that those are the hard decisions as an executive that you have to make. And, and, and how do you make it? Like, how do you decide when like someone like, let's say that Bob is like amazing at his job. Um, and, but everyone's complaining about Bob. How do yeah. you how do you decide or what do you do with someone like that? Well, we're just fully committed to the the culture and the people. And so he just can't stay. I mean, he, yeah. no matter how good he is, because here's the thing. You will find someone who's as good and not toxic. I mean, you just that's what people are afraid of. They're afraid, oh, I'll never find someone as good or, you know, will they ever have his skill set? 
you got to be willing to take that risk because your whole culture is at stake, like I mentioned, and your credibility. People, that's that's where you begin to crack the trust and credibility between leadership and, and team is when you say you're all these things, but then you don't do it by letting Bob and, and those people stay there. And that that crack just gets wider and wider with each one of those those little decisions. So you really have to be committed to this is our culture and we're going to stick to it no matter what. And if we need to go find someone else, we will. And you just trust and trust in your ability to go and recruit and find the the right people to to replace them. But yeah. in my humble opinion, there has to be a zero tolerance for for that sort of thing. Here's the the unique thing that I'll tell you that we learned. The healthier our culture got, people started to self-select out. Some of the toxic people started to self-select out. Really? They, yeah, they couldn't be there anymore. Like it, like <laughs> they were like, I got to go get a different job or this doesn't feel right. Or I don't like the direction we're wow. headed. And they start to self-select out. It's almost like a, like the vibration changed and they couldn't stand the new vibration. Yeah, it's, like, oh, it's too high in here. Yeah. <laughs> My head yeah. hurts. And so wow, they would, uh, and then just... other people, like you mentioned, will self-sabotage. So they are self-selecting out, but they're doing, they're making you do the hard work. They're making you make them leave rather than making the decision to leave. Wow. That's You'll see both really fascinating. How long did it take for you to turn things around? I'd say that it took us about two and a half years to go from where we were to where I felt really proud of, of where, uh, where we had gotten to. And we're not perfect by any means, but I can oh, tell I know. You, that's everyone pretty good. Here, everyone here feels feels appreciated and respected and and cared for. And I can say that because we just did a, a survey where we had 92% participation, by the way. That's engagement nice. on a voluntary survey. Um, and they tell us that. So mm. uh, and we constantly do those to make sure we're doing our work and, and that sort of thing. So as as with any kind of discipline, it's always hard to know, like should I give up? Should I continue? So it's taken you two, you know, two years to turn things around. Like what's a, if you wanted to do something like this, what's a realistic expectation and what to have, what happens after the first, because we all want quick fixes. Yeah. This is what's so interesting about people that want to do culture work. They're like, well, we took that class. Nothing's changed. You know, <laughs> you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> do you think this two month class is going to change everything or this one class is going to, so what's a realistic trajectory of like took two years where you actually can actually look at the results and see the change what do you think is realistic expectation of what kind of change and what kind of discipline and focus you have to continue during that two-year period so i'd say probably two years at minimum and it really depends on the size of the organization where most organizations make the the critical mistake they'll do all the things that we've done and they've got socials, they've got the happy hours, they're appreciating employees, they've got beautiful benefit packages, but the culture is still bad and they don't understand why. Mm -hmm. My firm belief is they have not standardized on a leadership philosophy, fully committed to it and require that every leader lead in that philosophy. Because here's what happens. you got a beautiful culture, right? You've established it. And you, my friend, are a servant leader. So your team is thrilled. They love you. They feel supported. I'm over here and I'm command and control. Nobody can do it other than me. And so you just do what I tell you. I'm the, my way is the only way. And, you know, I don't need your ideas. I just need you to do the work. So my folks are having a completely different experience. Same culture, same beautiful benefits, same holidays and all this great stuff you've done as a company, but two completely different experiences of the same organization. And so the, the real key is, getting your entire lead, leadership team pulling in the same way under a, a common leadership philosophy so that everyone in your organization has the same experience. Doesn't mean we all do it the same way. We all have our own spin for how we do servant leadership, but we're all following the principles of, of servant. Mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. So if you can get that in place first, then the rest of it becomes so much easier because you're all operating from the same sheet of music and, mm -hmm. and, uh, everything else that you're trying to do in terms of building trust and respect and, and all the other culture initiatives become easy because everyone's having the same experience. And so it's the leadership piece is the most important piece. And then adding in the rest of the initiatives just takes time. You could probably do all of the initiatives over the course of the same two-year period. But if you've got inconsistent leadership, you're just not going to get there. 
Yeah. And that's a hard thing is that you actually, like you described, you may actually have like, this department is great. This other department is spotty. They may be doing exactly the same things. And then they roll up to some other leader who doesn't necessarily have the same leadership principle as this part department that's great and this department that's not great and the whole organization doesn't have so then you have this like glowing team everyone like flocks to work for this particular leader the other yeah. people are like oh i need to leave this group but then you know you don't have you don't have the um discipline all the way up so i you know and i often often wondered because i i think that you really do need to have senior leadership involved but but you still see these glowing examples of one team that's doing a great job and people flock to that team and they continue to do a good job. But do you need, because and what I think I heard you just say is that you do need support throughout all the leadership. Oh yeah. Chain. And, Every and, level of our leadership is required to read the book servant and participate in our six week study course on servant leadership. Yeah. And everyone and we, 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 and we do not tolerate. So people that go through the exercise and then show up as command and control or fear and intimidation, they can't stay. Yeah, because they're impacting too many people, and so it's it's sort of those are a couple of areas where we just really have zero tolerance on toxicity and and if you're not going to do servant leadership, you you can't be a leader here because those are the two most influential things in the whole culture. Yeah, I love it. This has been so fantastic. I think one of the things that people don't know how to do is what I think you just showed us. Right, you weren't mean. You're just factual and the idea that servant leadership means like um i'm going to run over you or i'm going to basically like you know do what have i'm gonna have jim do reverend jim do whatever i want him to do because he's supposed to be my servant right you know yeah, it's like yeah. nope <laughs> that's not how it works i'm here to accept love and support you but if you're not being you know a good participant and a member it's, it doesn't work that's, That's what not. I saw happen. Yeah. We have a really high standard for productivity and uh, quality here. And we expect people to, to achieve that high standard. We just do it in a, in a way that is, like I said, probably more humane. Um, anything else that you want to share about the Zen executive um, gems of wisdom that we didn't touch upon? I think in closing, I would just, you know, ask, we, we touched on it a little bit, but just really embrace the influence that you have as a leader. I would also say, even if you're not a leader, you can still model these things. You can model these things for your team. You can, you can suggest um, things to your boss that under the guise of team building that might get them leaning in this direction. But as leaders, I would say, be mindful of your influence. Understand that you can impact someone's life, not only for the 40 hours or or 50 hours they're at your office, but they take that stuff home with them. And so uh, the more you can create an environment where they feel safe and fulfilled, not only are you helping your organization because they're more productive, but you're also uplifting the world, right? Because you're sending people out into society now that, that feel that same way and they can operate from their own center because they have a, a job where they feel cared for and respected. Yeah, I love it. I um, what I love about that is it goes back to the very beginning of our conversation. We're not compartmentalized into these things. So just because I had a bad day at work, it probably is going to like expand <laughs> out, right? You yeah. may have a bad day at work. All of a sudden, you bring it and have a bad day with your family. That actually goes over to your kid that has a bad day at school, which then affects the teacher. I mean, it's it's we're all interconnected. Right. Exactly. It's never just one isolated. I had a bad day at work and, uh, you know, so how do you actually create a positive influence? So all those things radiate that same love, support and caring versus the toxicity. Right. So how do you do that? I love that idea. That was a great final closing. Thank you so much. We have been talking to Reverend Jim Blake and about his book, The Zen Executive Gems of Wisdom for Enlightened Leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, bless you, my friend. Thank you. Oh, I get blessed by Reverend. I like that. <laughs>